Hi, and welcome to Shine, Love and Light On. I've got the beautiful Sarah Miller here with me today, and we are talking about how we can shine love and light on our birth process and the birth story that we have of our own and how it can be lined up with our creative process in all aspects of our life. It's something that I recently was made aware of when I did a drum making workshop with Sarah and it was a beautiful weekend where we created our shamanic drum, a frame drum with a kangaroo skin and some hoop tree. Is it hoop tree? Hoop pine. Hoop yeah. pine um, as a frame and a huge emotional um, spiritual process that was divine. And I invited Sarah in after that to help us kind of make this a little bit more mainstream if we can. Thanks so much, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here, Penny. And I love talking about the drum and birth. So, <laughs> so I guess one of the things that I always start with is, um, you know, and, and in your answer, you can talk a little bit about how you got into drum making and stuff. But why is it we don't understand much about our birth? And what, you know, what is it that's hiding us as women from really celebrating that in our our own birth? Um, or birthing other children, live or otherwise. So, yeah. Well, I guess, I guess we live in a culture that um, we call patriarchal, and what we mean by that is it values the masculine and um, often males, but also masculine values and um, masculine religions. So, with a male god often on high, separated from us near beings down on earth. <laughs> They arose out of actually and in reaction to very goddess-centred, very earth-bodied uh, religions. So part of the process was to annihilate the religions that came before them. So we've got 40,000, 50,000, well, in this country, you know, even more, but uh, a history of religions and ways of being that honoured the body, our body and the earth body, and that honoured birth, breastfeeding, men are, uh, menopause, dying, and understood that death was actually um, the precursor to life. And so all of these um, very, very female-centred, particularly around birth um, and caring for children, but um, also human-centred in terms of life, death, life, were kind of suppressed and squashed. So it's a really long answer to a short question because what happened was those natural, normal and sacred processes were um, not demonised but were, you know, really pushed down and feminine wisdom and knowledge was particularly suppressed. So it was almost as if we wouldn't know how to birth and that it really wasn't that important and you need an expert to help you. And it was sort of, in, in Europe, it was around the... Um, 14, 1500s, where they burnt all the witches, which meant the midwives and things, for 500 years. Not many people know that. It was 500 years of burning midwives, wise women, herbalists, um, and um, men who supported them, and children. And then they came up with these doctors who um, introduced forceps. And because they had forceps, birth became a surgical process. Women were not allowed to perform surgical processes, so birth became the domain of doctors and experts and men. So rather than being a natural, normal domain and the domain of women and midwives, it, it became an enclave. Um, and it was like our, our knowing about birth was That's shut down. Sad. And it, and it keeps going, even though we don't, you know, that, so that those traces still linger today. And many women fear birth. Um, what we see on TV is a woman screaming in hospital. You know, they used to put her legs up in stirrups on her back in bright lights with all these people looking at her, told to fear, not told about their anatomy. You know, there's all these reasons and, and really cut off from our bodies. Um, so many of us fear birth. Many of us don't know enough about it. We haven't witnessed it. We're not around watching it. Um, yeah, and so we just, it, it's, it's 
it's not something that our culture celebrates. We do in a way, like you give birth and yay, but it's about rather than um, empowering women to trust their bodies to make a baby, which there's not, not too much interference with making a baby. They can't actually get in there because our bodies just know what to do. You know, your blood, your blood pressure lowers and your blood vessels expand. Uh, you know, your immune system changes. All these things go on naturally without us having to do much because our body knows to prepare and make a baby. But then when it comes to birth, that area they can control, they come in and, and we live in a culture which disempowers us. So we're, we, we get fearful. And when you're fearful, what happens? You you're kind of yeah. You fly yeah. and fright. So it's, birth is not something to fear, but because we're in this phase of, oh my, and we, we're kind of scared, and all of that actually can disrupt the birth process. Um, yeah, so I'm, I can keep going and I feel like I've gone way off track. Oh, no, um, beautiful. And one of the, the reasons I guess um, I'm quite interested in this is because I had two birth, um, live birth experiences and one was where I didn't understand my body. I didn't, I'd gone to a hospital course and they said to breathe like... <laughs> I don't even remember. It was so uninspiring and didn't even really make any sense that I couldn't actually take it on. Um, so that I, then I ended up having um, a gas and an epidural because it got to a point when they went, you're only like halfway through. And I'm thinking, really, this is too hard and had no one to sort of go, no, of course you can do it. Trust your body. None of that was in the conversation through to then discovering other women in my circle had had births they hadn't had drugs and they used to be scared of the dentist i'm thinking what have they done so i got curious and they had an experience of hypnobirthing and what the massive difference was there was training and extensive training for a weekend and a subsequent weekend and your partner went to the training and then you listened to audio every night for months beforehand so when i came to the birth process it was i trusted my body I was in a, and I did have no drugs and the staff around me were surprised when suddenly my baby came out because I wasn't yelling and screaming and it was just a different experience. So much around information and support and um, what I was made to believe I could do. Yeah, and I think that's really important what you're made to believe what you can do. Like it really is, many of us... Um, we're actually taught in our culture not to trust our bodies. And, uh, and I think, you know, this is why the work I do all interrelates. Um, our periods, you know, we, we bleed um, and we live in, with a cyclical, from our um, menarche to our menopause, we live a cyclical experience, um, which is very different to a non-cycling body. Uh, but what we're still taught uh, about our menstruation is it's pretty yucky. It's pretty shameful. At best, it's a nuisance. And this is a very pervasive cultural story. And so what that does is we, that blood that we produce each month, it's not only that that is yucky and um, um, kind of off. We, we internalise that as a shame, a shame about our body and we live with it. And there's a great new book about bloody time, Victorian oh, Women's love that. Uh, and, it, and it highlights that this is a pervasive menstrual taboo. And when you have a taboo like that, this is, you know, we don't trust our body. So why would we turn up to the birth altar, which all we've seen is pretty scary and, oh, my God, and um, with, with that kind of trust. So hearing you say that you did that hip, um, hypnotic birth process and what that really is, birth is a, and pregnancy as well, you know, they talk about the different brains in our body. You know, there's, a, there's the body mind that's preparing us for pregnancy and it's actually dropping us into a different state. We're not in that logical, rational out there. We, we're, it's a much more internal state and it's much more intuitive and much more emotional. I don't know about you, but when I was pregnant, I could cry at the drop of a hat, you know. You, you, feel, you feel those changes and um, you know them, but again, no one says to you that that's actually part of the process. Part of the preparation is is switching the, the more right brain um, and you're almost more open to uh, the creativity that is all around and within so that when you birth, it's not just you. I, I remember that feeling of 
oh my God. Like it was like the universe bearing down. It wasn't just from here. It was this whole force. But in my first birth, I also shut down to that. Ah, like that, you know, I get fearful, scared. The midwife had told me I wasn't in labor. Oh, yeah, here I am, you know, having all these contractions. And But they know, again, the experience is the experts know better. That was a, uh, a hospital midwife. She knew better than, my, than I would know. And so, again, that was don't trust your body. You don't know what's happening. I know you're not in labor. So, again, another fraught thing that just compounded um, all the other stories that I had about my body and many women have about our body. So, yeah, we need to remember that women, um, actually 80% of births across the world are home births. You know, this medicalised system that we have in the West is not everywhere, um, but it's we still live in a largely patriarchal society. So all over the world, many women are still given um, a framing that their bodies can't really be trusted. But in some cultures, it's more acceptable that women know how to birth than in our culture. Um, and our cesarean rate is going up and up with, you know, we, we give thanks for Western medicine when we need it. But what we're seeing is we have, you know, 35, 40% these are rates because sometimes women are choosing it, you know, oh, why would I want to give birth? Um, and there are so many reasons why you want to, but they wouldn't know that, you know, your immune system is improved through a vaginal birth versus a Caesar. Um, the lungs are given the necessary squeezing to breathe. Um, the oxytocin is released in a way, um, and the oxytocin is the love drug that bonds you and Bubba. The baby is, is um, designed to come through the birth canal and all the processes that work on the baby for that. <laughs> because a lot of women are led to believe their body will irreversibly change because of the birth. Like my vagina won't be the same, you know, I'll be stretched and saggy, all these sorts of things. So they go, well, oh, and it'll be painful as well. Couldn't possibly, pain's bad. There's no yeah. sort of interpretation, which I learned through hypnobirthing was that that's just a message. That's just my body saying it's changing and for me to be aware of it and stuff. And then you can learn how to, so there's a whole, unfortunately a way of um yes scaring us into yeah. our body will be changed i don't want to change it i'm young I'm blah, 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 whatever and and actually instead of going isn't that amazing that it can do that would how yeah. phenomenal that my body will stretch that far yeah. and let that size through and all these other animals do it regularly and women do it in fields all around the world without medical intervention so yeah it's just yeah. this i agree a real lack of trust in ourselves and i think that's one of the reasons i wanted to talk to you because of that parallel that it has in so many other areas of our lives so anyone listening who's never had a baby or you know doesn't have any interest in having one or had them many many years ago this is still a relevant conversation because of how often we um birth things in our life really isn't it yeah yeah um, and we'll we'll talk about. I just want to say two quick things for that. One is that pain again is shunned in our society. You know, we feel pain. We often take a medicine to fix it. And and you know, I get that. That that can be really helpful. But sometimes pain, as you say, it's it's um, teaching us something as well. And my um, first teacher in this area, Jane Hardwick Collins, when she was having her third birth, which was an ecstatic birth, she went into the pain. You know, sometimes when you're sick and you're lying now, I don't know about you, but uh, I can be feeling really sick. And if I actually focus all my attention on that pain, it's almost like everything shifts. Mm -hmm. And that is the opportunity that if we actually focus in on the pain, we don't try and avoid it. We don't, you know, go elsewhere. It's like a doorway and a portal and you can actually come into an altered state of mind. And birth is really actually about an altered state of mind. It is life is you know wow it's such a wow so amazing and that altered state of mind is is helps us prepare for parenting because that's the other thing i want to say about this is when we birth in a way that's disempowering how the hell are we going to raise a child because what we've learned is we don't know we can't trust our body how do we listen to our other little human being whom we take in our arms for the first time with a sense that I don't really know, that I'm not good enough, that I needed, you know, all it, it actually affects our parenting. And that's the other thing, how we birth affects how we parent. 
um, as well as all the other creative things that we do in life. So the more that we can trust our body, um, the more that we can trust our impulses when it comes to parenting too. And I think that's, that's what it's like in intuition, this sense that in a birth process, our body just takes over. I mean, my recollection was it was, <laughs> I was very, very present, probably the most present I've ever been in my life is like just the next breath, like just focus on the next breath. <laughs> I can't, if someone talked to me, it's like, can't even hear you. Yeah. Right. I'm so focused. Um, and such a powerful feeling because also you can do whatever you goddamn like. Like you can tell someone to get the hell out of there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just it's so primal and it's such an amazing experience for that reason, I guess, too. This is like and that focus. I love hearing you say that because that is it's this focus of and we can bring that energy and that attention and that uh, to other things that we do. But it is it you know birth is a particular way of kind of taking us there we might shut that down but it will naturally take us into that focused inward state that we are going to with the baby birth the baby it's not all us you know baby is letting us know when baby wants to come and and together you know this but it's such a powerful amazing process and I would love more women to have that opportunity to be really supported in trusting themselves and their baby and where intervention needs to happen for sure but not at, certainly not at the level where have, where have mm. in this and I think there's now. parallels with trusting our body generally. Like again, like if you you haven't had a birth experience or this is not you know current thinking for you right now, is to think of those parts of your body when it is giving you messages. It's just like a birth experience. It's got intuitive knowledge. It's it's yeah. telling you something. What might it be telling you? Get curious or notice. Yeah. yeah, I do a lot of dance and movement and somatic, you know, a somatic kind of process. It's quite a different understanding of the body, um, the people in the dance world, which is why I love it, because, you know, this, there's an alive, awake intelligence in our body. And, you know, I mean, like it's in, incredible. The, the stem cells that they use that come out menstrual blood, again, wow, um, you know, and the umbilical cord, those cells can transform themselves into anything, you know, any part of our body, you know, it might become a tongue or a, a part of your hand or the heart, you know, like, but how does it know? How did, how did, and even the word itch, like, you know, we, we objectify rather than, you know, subjectify these parts of our body and this knowing and this intelligence, like there's such intelligence in our body. And, you know, we prioritise the mind as if we're, you know, but the more that we can, oh, wow, what's my body telling me? And I think often our body's telling us things that, oh, like for me, I love my cups of tea. Tea doesn't sound like much, but I've been having too much and it affects my tummy. And, you know, um, I'll actually just finally having something different. And it's just like, you know, it's just listening to whatever our body is telling us and we get rewarded for that because it's taking us to a more healthy place or alerting us if something's wrong you know it's all it is great to listen to our body and I think yeah. even when I was listening to you then I thought of the times when we don't we resist and it actually just persists like I love that quote what we what we resist just persists and this idea that if you ignore it you think oh it's going to go away but it doesn't it it will manifest somewhere else or it'll get worse or um yeah, so these are little messages, little gold nuggets that our body has. And I think this is such a beautiful way of drawing our attention to it, that yeah. our, our body has so much wisdom. So yeah. maybe quickly, do we, is there anything sort of in your past story about how you got into drum and, and you've talked about dancing and embodied work that has allowed you to see, wow, this birth process isn't just something that's happened, it's one off. And it's not, you know, there's no sort of links to how I'm continuing in my life now. Well, yes. I mean, running drum making workshops for a start, every time I'm just amazed, you know, for me, I just, I feel really honoured because I keep getting to see the intelligence um, of each and every woman who shows up and the kinds of, you know, problems that arise in the drum making Um so maybe tell people listening, what is this drum making? Because I, I did make oh, okay. a little bit of an explanation, but so, why is it so yeah. sort of symbolic and, and... So the drum, oh, look, I should, um, I should bring out my drum. But the first thing I want to say is 
that a drum, the frame drum is a pan cultural, and so that means, you know, across the world, pan cultural instrument that has been used um, in ceremony by women for, you know, tens of thousands of years. And we know this now by the millions, millions of images and artifacts and icons and paintings of women drumming. Lane Redmond was a pioneer who looked at the Middle East and um, Middle East and Europe, and then we have people like Max Dashu. All over the world, we see women were drumming. And you know, at the beginning, when I talked about goddess religion, so and the drum is a round container that uh, vibrates with life. The sound is a sound of creation, and that ripples out. And so it was seen as a sacred instrument, and the rhythms. Um, were used for all kinds of things, recognising that the rhythm can take us into altered states of consciousness. I think the earliest um, painting we have of drums is a cave in Anatolia, which is modern day Turkey, it's about 5000 BC, and um, it's, they're, they're dancing and they're transforming into animals, so it is that kind of shamanic process. So there's this amazing instrument, the drum, all over the world that women use. And then um, I came across it through Jane Hardwick Collins' course, The Four Seasons Journey, um, which is a year-long course, which I was attracted to because it was about connecting to the earth, connecting to the feminine and myth and story, which are like three passions of mine. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I rocked up and the first thing we do is make a drum. Sounds simple. We're going to make a drum. But as you would know, and women who come to the workshop, it's that how you are birthed into the world is an imprint that you carry through your life. So very briefly, um, and I have talked about this before, but I was four or five children, easy natural birth. Um, but at the beginning of my drum making process, um, I went to pick, choose my hide, which was deer. And Jane said, now they're all does, they're all females. And I looked at the one below me and it had buck written on it. And, and like, I've got the wrong one. You know, I could hear myself saying that. But I chose this one or I felt it chose me. Um, I was a bit sceptical. There's no doubt about it. When James said, ask your hide if that's the one for you. I'm kind of rolling my eyes. But I did and I heard this yes. Mm -hmm. right. Anyway, the story unfolded, cutting my drum, feeling like I was getting it all wrong and I can't do this, which was a story of mine, you know, writing university essays, I used to screw them up, I can't, I can't, I can't. I'd get them done, but it was fraught. You know, a lot of my creativity was fraught. Anyway, I get to this point where Jane says to have a break, you know, like she came over to me and she said, you know, what would be something helpful to do? And I went to this amazing book, um, Being Born, uh, Robin, whose last name I forget, um, I'll, I'll get a reference for you. And, you know, the way the universe works, I was looking up natural, normal birth. And of course, it opened at a page, wrong sex child. Well, I just burst into tears. I literally burst into tears. I thought, uh -huh. how could I not remember that they wanted a boy? I was supposed to be a boy. Um, and I had all these stories and my sister stirred me, um, but I kind of forgotten it. But And when I read about what it is to be a wrong sex child, it is, you feel really wrong and you feel like you can't get anything right because here, the whole being of you is wrong. And then on top of that, I was born into a culture where being female is less than. So I really saw my beautiful drum, he, but he was the wrong sex. I was the wrong sex. And that was just the beginning of so many learnings in this process of making my drum and coming to a place of accepting the okayness of me, you know, which is a big thing to accept. And, it's, you know, my drum at the back, it's, it wasn't all perfect. You know, I wanted it all to flow and look perfect. No. He wasn't going to give me that and I wasn't going to give me that because that's not the story I needed to learn. The story I needed to learn was it, it, it's okay how I turn up um, and how I show up in the world is, is um, there's, there's rightness in that. So that's been a really long and beautiful journey of coming to that through my drum. And, um, it, you know, I've had so many stories with women um, seeing how they create the drum is played out in the actual creation um, of their own creation, their own birth story. It's like an imprint. It's like this 
thing that we hold, this story that we hold about ourselves that we unconsciously take to all these processes that we do, you know. Um, I don't know if you want me to give more examples or ask a question oh, about oh, that. Or... No, they're fascinating. I was going to actually think about my own and I was wondering, I think for me what I noticed in the workshop was, wow, I don't really know my own birth story. So there was this fascination that I knew parts of it, but I um, got curious and, and found that there were lots of different layers in that um, I was induced but, and there was in, in the day my dad wasn't in the room and all those, you know, lots of different things, I guess, which to an element mean um, do I trust my own creative process? I tend to just give it a go and just yeah. and, and I did on that day. It didn't, I wasn't particularly stressed. I come out and then I'll sort of see what happens and yeah. work it out. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. yeah. It is interesting, isn't it? And when we talk about the birth and the birth story, remembering also that the pregnancy is also um, important. Again, um, you know, in utero, we pick up the feelings and energies uh, that are that are present in our mother. We're not actually separate from our mother. So if she's anxious and stressed, we're anxious and stressed. That's, you know, that's going through our blood. Whatever's going through her blood and her body, so the hormones of stress that are going through her, um, that'll be in there too. And if she's feeling really nourished and supported and healthy, then that's this grounding that we have. And then in the birth, you know, if we have drugs, and um, I, for my first birth, I, I didn't have any when I was born, um, but the first birth of my son, I did have gas. And I remember thinking gas wasn't a drug. And I've heard women say it again. Well, it is. I, <laughs> I hardly remember any part of that. So then the experience of someone who's had gas or drugs might be that they numb out. There's a period where everything's going along and then suddenly it's like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That feeling of not knowing and just kind of getting stuck for a while. And it's interesting to map that where in the labour you actually had the drug. Um, yeah, so we have, um, I'm really conscious not to share too many women's stories because um, not having permission, but um, my co-host, Emily, won't mind me telling you about hers, but she was a planned Caesar, Caesar whose mother went into labour, but rather than let her continue the labour, they stopped the labour and so then and waited for the doctor to come 24 hours later wow. and then did the Caesar. Like they didn't want the natural... Um, birth to happen. I, I'm not sure that her mum wanted it to happen either. She'd had two seasons before. And so Emily um, often finds, you know, she's in this creative process and then there's just bang, there's just this shutdown. And she gets very anxious because you can imagine a baby who's going into labour spontaneously and they give you drugs to stop you and you're kind of immobilised. And she has this kind of immobilising. And it can be quite a while and she has to wait and it's very scary. Um, so yeah, it's it, it really, they really can impact um, the way we do creative process. And then we can work on it and be with it, you know. Um, that's the thing. That's the thing. Once we realise there's a pattern there, we can gently tend to that pattern and, and see when it comes up and, ah, you know, I'm more related to that. Let me see if I can hold that part of me, tend that part of me and see if I can, you know, shift the story a little bit. So I think that's really important part of this process too. You know, I'm not into healing overnight. Like these things take time and um, but holding okay. those stories with tenderness. I guess it's also not about saying if you've had a particular birth, that's something wrong with you or that, you know, you're stuck in this way forever now or, you know, if you do see that there's a pattern emerging or, you know, there is some sort of link to how you could creatively birthing processes and stuff, um, it doesn't mean you can't work with it. I think that's yeah and I think that's a really important point because it's actually also your medicine like my teacher Jane would say you know the wound reveals the cure and so for me haha wrong sex child the feminine is wrong what's all my work about reclaiming the feminine like that it's exactly like this wow of course I'm doing this work because that wound that was the wound my wound was that the feminine is wrong I'm wrong as a female and so and in my early years I really really rejected um i didn't want to do craft i didn't want to wear pink oh look i'm in a pink t-shirt today um and i wasn't going to do dance um even though i like like ballet anything that was i just rejected but 
you know, that was trying to go along, trying to write myself, trying to be more boy-like. But then another part of me was just feeling the rage of that and the injustice of that. And so my life's work really is around reclaiming the feminine. So again, when we know our story and we know what that wounding is, there will be so many gifts in that. And that might be part of what we're bringing to the world. Um, yeah, so it's not the wrongness, which we can jump back into. Um, you know, that's what my story taught us, the rightness of everybody's experience, wherever you're at. Um, but it is an honouring and a recognising that it is likely to be playing out. So what about someone who might be able to find out their birth process because they were adopted or there's no recollection or something? So what that in they- itself is a story, isn't it? So this not knowing. And it'd be really interesting how that plays out. I mean, so if you're adopted, you'll know that's that's a big story, being adopted. Um, so part of the actual birth, you might not know. So not knowing might be something that plays out. Being disconnected, being cut off might play out. Um, and if you so if you were adopted, that will play out too. The rejection, you know, um, Maybe it might be the rejection story. It might be the, you know, taken in and, and, and loved up by another family. I don't know how it, how it plays out, but it's still worth investigating what you don't know. And then the other thing that we look at is each rite of passage kind of builds upon the next one. So as I said before, wrong child, well, how I came to my period, uh, my first blood, was it was, you know, it, it was reinforced that wrongness. So you could look at your Menarch story and see what what it was for you. And then you can actually look at how you do creative process, map it out. Do you jump in? You know, we had a woman um, recently saying, you know, I jump into things feet first. And she's like, oh, my goodness, I was, you know, a breech baby, came out foot link, you know, feet feet first, jumping out. So um, do I take my own time and and wait, you know, uh, you know, so there's lots of things that you can look at and start mapping. These are mapping tools. You can look at um, you can look at your first sexual experience as a rite of passage. If you've had menopause, you can begin to look at that. We they build on, and the the healing that we can do around them will then come into the next one. So yeah, it's a really good process of of mapping um, and mapping where you are in your life story and your menstrual cycle itself, like. Um, it, that's a beautiful map. When I talk about reclaiming the feminine, the menstrual cycle is, you know, is a reflects life, death, life. You know, we watch a plant, you know, seed. Think of that beautiful seed under the soil in the warm, dark nourishment of the dark instead of the reviled dark. You know, and a few little roots down, and the seed pushes up, and it grows, and it blossoms, and full bloom. Hello, and then you know, it's had its time, and the block, the might fruit or the flower might fall away and then there'll be seeds of the fruit and they'll fall back down into the soil. Our menstrual cycle follows that same path, you know, that same cycle. And um, the more that we can track our own, you know, what's our mood, what's our energy, what's our sexual drives, our other drives? Are we feeling that pull of growth and and expansion and intensity? Um, And then that kind of, oh, still, you know, sharing, wanting to share and da la la but this kind of the critical edge that can come in as we reflect on what's working and what's not working and what might we need to let go of, you know. And it's like our menstrual cycle has this beautiful map and we can trace that and see how we are in in the creative cycle of that as well. So there's lots of ways you can get clues um, in terms of your life and the patterns and stories that are playing out. That's so interesting. Um, how can, or what sort of tips and things could people take away or what options do they have now? You've talked about mapping and is that like journaling or reading up books or do you know of resources that if this is sort of triggering some interest for people? Yeah, well, it depends what kind of interest. I mean, if they're interested in, um, birth and birth, there's lots of books, um, uh, Jane's book, Ten Moons, is a beautiful one, The Inner Journey of Pregnancy, if you're preparing for that. Um, gentle Birth, Gentle Mothering. Um, oh, what's her name? Beautiful. There's lots of books around birth. Sarah Buckley's book um, and the Being Born book, if you want to map your process. Um, so that's a beautiful one. If you want to look at um, 
the menstrual taboo and how that play, plays out in society, certainly about bloody time. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll promote that book because it talks about um, the menstrual revolution that we need and it really gives you a good understanding of how the taboo might be playing out in your life, your daughters, your nieces, your cousins, you know, young girls, but also young men. But it also looks at and gives a really good understanding of the menstrual cycle, of what it is. And again, we focus on the blood, you know, in our culture, and it's as if all the cycle is, is about bleeding um, and getting pregnant. Well, we don't get pregnant very often, um, you know, like it, over those 40 years or whatever of bleeding time. And so it's part of that work is to understand all the things that are going on in your menstrual cycle and with the, the changing hormones, estrogen and progesterone, and they have very different functions um, and they're really important for bone health, for heart health, for your cardiovascular system, for your mind. Again, so when young girls, so if you've got young daughters and you look at, you know, checking out some nice doctors and you go and they all tell you how they know, they're all certified in all the different ways girls can not have their period. Um, just take a step back for a moment and investigate the importance of the menstrual cycle. It is a healthy functioning cycle and the World Health Organization now recognizes that it's a primary indicator of your well-being. If there is something up with your menstrual cycle um, and with your period and they're not coming on time and all of that, go and investigate it and, and, and find a doctor that recognizes the value of your menstrual cycle because when you get to my age, and menopause, they suddenly say to you, oh, you really need those hormones. Well, hello, why are you taking them away from the young girls who naturally are having it? And I get really cross about that because they're giving the hormones to us over here when we're actually at the end of that hormonal phase, that cyclical phase, and they're taking them away. And they're really profound. Um, over 150 functions in our body rely on the dance between the hormones as they cycle around. Um, so if you, and Wild Power is one of my favourite books on that. That's Alexandra Pope and Sajani Hugo Willett. But, uh, and it's, again, like birth, our menstrual cycle um, offers us you know, these different energies that we can work with as women. And you know, if you want to do a presentation, like we should be talking, uh, perfect, I, I no longer have a menstrual cycle, so I'm with the moon, we're leading up to a full moon. So that's why I can't stop talking. <laughs> like it's the woohoo, I'm out here, I'm feeling really good. Estrogen has that effect. If, you, if you're a cycling woman, use that. Use that time when you want to be out in the world, doing your presentations, doing your talk. When you've got your period, you're probably going to be a little bit like when you were talking, Penny, about your birth. It's this much more inward, deep introspection. Use that time to be with yourself, you know, and to be really connecting to the earth, connecting to your dreams. You know, there are other hormones that help us do that. So, wow, there's this whole um, body of knowledge around um, our cycle. So I would really get you to explore any of that. Come on the Four Seasons journey with me. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we dive into this over a year long. Um, but the other thing I just want to mention for women, if you're interested in um, trying to conceive and or con contraception, Natural fertility is just, again, this wonder tool. And Jane Bennett and Francesca Nash, she's from Sydney, but they have fantastic resources out there for you to track when you're fertile. Um, and it's really not hard. <laughs> it's not hard at all, but we're not, we're not taught. So we go on the pill and we use these things. And then girls aren't using condoms and we want them to use condoms um, for, for safe sex. We want them to have healthy, safe sexual lifestyles. Um, and there's so much to look at. And the other thing I just want to say around that is what we're finding, what the research shows is if you feel shameful about your period and not really talking about it, that affects your sexual assertiveness. And by that I mean it affects your ability to say no when you do not want to have sex. It also affects your ability to say yes and ask for what you want. Can you pleasure me in this way? Can all these things which, which make us feel proud and okay and comfortable in our skin. We need to reclaim our mena as a powerful, positive, healthy, normal part of being a woman and because um, it has huge implications if we don't. I love it. Yeah. I'm passionate. I know I am. I'm so passionate. It's so important. Well, I love it. Same. So it's nice to come from you. But um, what I do love and I think you've really articulated is that 
it's knowledge. Like we don't have this knowledge about our menstrual cycle and we don't have this knowledge about menarc and, and what it's doing other than we think it's around pregnancy and we might get interested in it when we want to get pregnant and why is it not working and that's about it. But otherwise, you know, all these different things around our thyroid health and our heart health and, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful way of checking in in our body yeah. to notice it. Um, and I, I want to add on to that, Penny, just because you've reminded me. So I'm also involved in a project on menopause. And one of the things we're doing is just gathering women together to share stories because what we know is it's the, the story sharing. You know, women sharing their stories is a really powerful antidote to this expert culture that we live in. And we begin to validate our own experiences and listen to other women's experiences and learn from each other. And it's a beautiful cultural reframe. And we want to put menopause back into the mainstream conversation because it's not in there. And there's, again, this silence around it. Um, if you can hear something in the background, my daughter's just making herself a nice, um, a nice drink and cracking ice blocks and all of that. Um, yeah, so I really, again, the same thing. It's a taboo and we're not talking about it and we're coming to this amazing altar. You know, this is the last one before we die. Um, so it's a really beautiful opportunity to reframe our own stories and to, to rebirth ourselves into the world, to do the medicine or the gifts that we have, bring that into the world. But we need to do that inner work. And we need to have it framed that we know this inner work is valuable and important and we need time to... It's like going into the menstrual cave, but mm, for a really long time, we might need a couple of years. And again, having that recognised and articulated. Um, and that there's nothing wrong with us, because I think, like we've said, it, it starts at the, our first men arc, but it's also in the birth process, something's wrong, my body's not doing it right, it shouldn't be like this, they're telling me I need to be labour this way, or um, it, even with... Um, menopause what age i should be of oh, too early or too late or yeah i shouldn't be bleeding this long or whatever like there's a gazillion different things so of course it takes away our power so i think we're both really passionate about and why i think we need to start talking about it more and just being curious and and exposing ourselves to different stories so that we know that it's okay it's normal this is my body my body labor is different to your body and yeah. no one could tell me what my body was going to do but had i known that the first time i would have been a little bit more empowered yeah. and having that sense to go no i actually feel like i'm ready or i'm not or whatever i wasn't trusting my body so and i love what you said i mean in our work when i do the moon song workshop we you know give women a map like we say this is a map but your body is the territory and what's going on for you is the reality and that's the thing for you to track and to understand so that's really important to to trust our bodies and to say hey this is happening for me what does this mean for me and and begin to investigate um, with your body as the primary way of knowing and trusting that and then you can look at um you know other women's stories and what worked for them and what didn't but yeah honing in on what's here it's not wrong it's telling you something um, and it may be like your period might be heavy because you need to rest. Your period might be really heavy because there is something going wrong that needs intervention. Uh, you know, there's all these kinds of things, um, but we really need to be listening. And a lot of women feel really dismissed, um, particularly around menopause. I think there's 20 minutes of education in the medical, when you get a medical degree on menopause. I mean, That's it's just problem. ridiculous uh, because it's a really powerful and process that involves a change in the physical, a change in the psychological and a change in the spiritual. So uh, really having um, not only doctors but naturopaths and carers and other women who are informed and listening to their stories really can help us reframe uh, like all the all of the rites of passage um, so that we feel... I think what you just pointed out too is that it's not just medical like it's not a physical thing each of these rites of passage and the birth as an example have these opportunities for us to connect spiritually and emotionally with ourselves and our story and our relationship i mean it's just this amazing portal isn't it to different yes. aspects of ourselves and if we 
hand it over to someone else and trust them, we don't get the opportunity. But it also, yeah, it takes our power away. And, and, I, and I, yeah, I think that's a really important point because we know, well, I, how could you not know? The world is in crisis, you know. We've got the COVID crisis, but we've got climate crisis. We've got, you know, the, we've just got all kinds of upheavals in the world reflecting the state which we're in. You know, we're polluting our waters. We're polluting our air. We're mining the lands. We're fracking country. We're not listening to Indigenous people. Domestic violence. We've got wars where we're raping young and old. Sex trafficking is one of the biggest trades in the world. We think commerce is about goods and, well, people are the number, number one or number two traded product in the world. Guns is the other one. I mean, we live in a world that is so beyond crisis. So we actually, this spiritual call for me, if this is like a, a spiritual soul deep call to say, hang on, this patriarchal, this absolutely um, crisis that we're in is, is a crisis of being in a mindset which separates us from body, which separates us from earth, which separates us from deep feminine wisdom. So for me, and this won't be for everyone out there, but really we need to, any work that we do healing ourselves in here, coming home to our bodies, is helping build this feminine consciousness that needs to come back because we have to transform the world we live in or it's over, you know. Like we're, we're such at the brink and um, it won't be over for Earth, totally, you know. She's so powerful. But the kind of world that we are bringing up um, our children into is just devastating so we really need to be doing some deep soul work and that's the beauty of our rites of passage that's the beauty of these painful experiences they take up take us deep down into the dark which is soil which is you know the feminine that that consciousness that we've actually suppressed and repressed and we need to come back in here and trust the deep wisdom and that call to protect and to care for country you know, Indigenous people have talked about this. You know, we need to care for country. We need to care for the children uh, because we're certainly not doing a very good job of it at the moment. So, yeah, it's, I just have a very strong um, desire for women to see this as opportunity to grow, to grow into the being that can serve the world. And it's not taking on all the problems of the world, but, you know, your little niche, your little bit that you can do um, is going to be a profound part of the healing. Well, it's a beautiful way to go, why would I do this? Is this have some selfish inner work? It's actually got a role in you understanding and being connected to how you can be at peace and then in doing that, that ripples through your community, doesn't it? And you can be a role model for others and you realise how disconnected we are. This is the, It's a real massive disconnection across the world that you can only trade people if you don't, feel anything for them <laughs> and you can only shoot people if you are so disconnected you don't even feel that they have feelings and emotions and there's no empathy and um you know there's a real sickness in it i guess isn't there so yeah this is a, w a way of us kind of appreciating and taking control of what we can and we can do it piece by piece yeah yeah and recognizing that we don't have control i think um I think that's, you know, our, our culture is a dom dominion and control. Um, but we do what we can and we control what we can and what we can't, you know, we bow to the mystery. Like, that's what I learn in my drum making workshops. I was just like, wow, Emily and I just kind of pinch ourselves going, we're here holding space and, and knowing that it's sacred and then we just trust that, you know, that ah, it's just a trust to the mystery, that there is an alive, awake intelligence you know, I'm on Bunwarabang land here and they've always known that um, that the world is alive and storied and we can start listening to that rather than thinking we come in here and know everything. Uh -uh. We're part of the earth and we can drop back in, we, you know, that deep dives are dropping back into the mystery and the intelligence and letting letting life flow through us, you know, and it's a, a wonderful thing because it's actually, oh, I don't have to you know, keep working, 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 you know, um, and being on and up. It's like actually the, the surrendering to this higher intelligence is, is beautiful. It's actually a respite in a way, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it is. it's a nice realisation. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times different things that you do to as 
offerings and maybe you can guide us to where we can find them so that anyone listening, I'll obviously put some show notes together, but if anyone's yeah. got a great memory, they might be able to just. Okay. Record. So my, um, my um, own website is Embodiment Stance and um, I think it's embodimentstance.com.au. So that's where I do my seasonal dance and the drum making and you can get to the moon song. Um, and the other way in is through the School of Shamanic Woman Craft. So that's where I first um, birthed my drum and that's what I now teach. I teach the moon song, which is a program out of the school, just a one day workshop on menstrual and menopausal wellness and all of the things we've been talking about. But then there's the year long journey. And so that's starting in November at the end of this year where you get, you know gather with women. And that's the other thing, just sitting down in circle with women, sitting on the earth, listening to each other and sharing our stories is profoundly healing. And so we do that um, every year with obviously a whole lot of other processes in place around, um, around the moon and recognising so dark moon and full moon and, and what it is to live in a way in which we're trusting um, the earth and her processes. So, uh, yeah, reclaiming feminine wisdom, reclaiming the blood mystery, um, that deep knowing that I was talking about. So that's the School of Shamanic Womancraft or my website, Embodiment Stance. Um, yeah. So, and they can reach you personally through those as well as links yeah. to you. And, yeah. and so many references and books and so many amazing women. I really bow to the women who've gone before me and are way showers, um, you know, stepping into their power and, and, and using it wisely. It's not power over, it's power within. And I think that's a big difference, again, the kind of model that we have. So I'm just excited, Penny, for what you're doing too, hearing about your juicy offerings and you know, looking and being curious, as you said, I think the curious mind is such a gift, you know, it's not about getting it wrong, it's just being curious, I mean, what's going on here, hmm. investigate, and that's what I'd say to women, follow your impulses, follow what's calling you, and, and see, see what arises, see where you end up. Oh, it's a beautiful in invitation, um, it's definitely what I've been doing, and my whole, I guess, project and, and offering at the moment is around discovering your wild, I can't tell you that Sarah's going to be the answer, but definitely if something's piquing your interest to follow that gut feel and go, I'm curious, I want to find out more, I'm, I want to try some of her work, um, I, you won't regret it, <laughs> definitely not. She's on social media as well, on Instagram, you can follow her. So yeah, thank you so much for giving us a little bit of insight into how our birth story or birth stories and, and different cycles that we're in every day, but, you know, particularly in certain um, milestones, I guess, in our life can really give us insight into the wisdom in our body and our, our creative process. If only we, if only we were taught this at school, but anyway, we can do our best now. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. Um, yeah. Talk to your sisters, your friends, your aunties, your mothers, your grandmothers, ask questions, you know, and, and um, yeah, listen and share. I think the storytelling amongst women is a really powerful way to um, to revolutionise the world. Yeah. And I think, too, if we can change the story around birth being a bad, uncomfortable thing that you have to get through. I remember talking about in mother's groups our, our birth stories, and I don't think it ever really came from a really empowered place. So, you know, if we can start to hopefully change that and give women an opportunity to... And it's almost a bit, and it's taboo because it's a bit judgy. Oh, well, they had a Caesar or they didn't yeah. and stuff like that. So to, to come from a really loving space and it's not right or wrong. It's, yeah. it's, it's just what is and what we can learn from it. Yeah. And as I said, you know, my birth, wow, that's been the whole impetus. What, what's your Caesar birth? What's your induced birth? What are, what are the things that you've learned through that that then become your medicine? And But just to say to um, some women, it's really nice to debrief to talk about the story with someone, someone who will actually listen. And because a lot of women, as you said, we hold this stuff and we judge ourselves and, oh, you know, it's fraught. So um, Emily, who I work with, I know she does a little bit of that, um, you know, and there are other women um, who will listen to your story and help you make sense of it and help you come to peace with it. Um, and, yeah, really trusting that because we do live in a culture that doesn't empower us and... Um, yeah, that can be, it's really hard and it can be really painful. Uh, 
but I just think tending with as much compassionate love to ourselves and all the parts of us and all you know we did our best that's the thing to say we do our best always we do our best with the information we have and part of this work is not to change what's happened because we can't but to inform more women and if you make an informed choice whatever that is great but I think a lot of women are making uninformed choices because they're not given the information so that's the thing choose what works for you knowing that women always do their best you know and that's all we can ever do um, maybe we change it if we could, but we can't. So come to peace with it and, um, yeah, just, just keep well, showing up. Something I've forgotten to ask or just maybe for someone who might be left, um, we did, I think, during our chat talk about the birth of our birth, how we came into the world, but also the births of our own children if we've been a, a mother. Um, but there were also ones I know we talked about in our workshop when they weren't live births or they were terminated or aborted and, and there's a lot of trauma that can come up. Can we quickly just quick address that for someone who's listening who might feel some sadness and, and upset that comes with thinking okay. about birth? Yeah. yeah. And so the first thing I would say is feel that upsetness. Like I can feel it rising in me. Mm. Um, yeah. Oh, it, again, that it, it's a rite of passage. Any child is a birth. Now, it may be a miscarriage, it may be an abortion, um, maybe stillbirth at the end, and I don't think that's the right language anymore, but there's going to be grief, you know, and, and I think, and, and again, it might be the right decision, what we needed to do, and that doesn't mean that you still won't have some grief around it. Um, sometimes it was a decision, sometimes it wasn't a decision. So I would definitely take the time to honour that. Um, I'm into ritual and ceremony, you know, it might be as simple as lighting a candle and holding your sacred space if you haven't done that. Um, again, you might want to debrief with someone and work through that and you can sit down and, and just talk to someone and listen, but feel your feelings too, like let them move through your body. And I think those things don't go away. You know, I, I think some of the grief that we hold for uh, lost children is a lifelong grief. Now that doesn't, and so, and so the more that we can experience Express it and be with it the more that it can soften in us and not be a rigid hard thing but something that we that you know it's a scar on our body but somewhere there is a scar on our body and that we can honor and hold that so yeah be really gentle with yourself and um yeah that's certainly something that comes up in the drum making there's there's tears and there's crying and there's you know oh lots of stories um around that because they're birth and just yeah honoring those children who who don't come as far and to not take on any sense of failure because i think it's as a mum you can feel i didn't do something right and that's why that happened or all sorts of things can happen but for us as women to just really honor ourselves to really love and be compassionate with ourselves yeah. and we do look at stories because they can like you said bring up things unexpectedly too right and I think ceremonies around that again can be really helpful women coming together to share their stories you know I've, through the drum making we've had some big tears and big emotions and women saying part of the work they want to bring to the world is just that you know there's death doulas but particularly around um yeah, the birth that didn't make it her side. So, um, and honouring that. But, you know, coming together, having ceremonies, inviting women. You know, this is, again, we sit down and we share our stories and we share our griefs. And that opens up the conversation for other women to speak about these things, which are really held taboo, um, particularly abortion, but also miscarriage. And, um, yeah, so I think any of those things, yeah, sometimes I think the larger conversation is death is a part of life. You know, I, I keep coming back to the cycles and, you know, why does one tree or one plant not make it? Why are some of the fruit rotten, you know? Um, what we, that's part of life and that disease and that death can actually nourish new life when, it's, when it becomes the soil, when we break down and compost. So with us too, but those deaths, um, you know, sometimes you're lucky enough. I, I, one thing to say, you can actually, if you have a, an abortion, you can actually ask and you have to sign forms but you can take that part of your baby and you can take it home and plant it in the soil. You can make ceremony. But again, women often aren't taught this, you know, um, and it's not easy, but you can do it. So investigate, research, find women 
and start um, doing whatever work you need to do to heal um, these big stories that we carry with us. And it's a bit of I'm hearing through like a collective that can come from it. We can be sharing in our experiences instead of having this feeling of loneliness and that I'm the only one. Um, you know, when we start to talk about our birth stories, we may not know that about someone. Like I would never have known from meeting you that you had this story that you were the wrong sex. And, you know, so if we go, oh, wow, I was too, or it just humanises us and makes us, um, yeah, relatable and loved. And I think, Penny, that, that's one of the points, this, you know, School of Shamanic Womancraft for me really brought home women sitting in circle. You know, we've sat in circle for longer than we have, and actually women, you know, across time, you know, sat down and we did the work together, whatever the work, and we were t t telling stories and listening. And I think, and I, you know, I do shamanic work, and often we think of the shaman as some person on their own, often a male doing some, you know, magical thing on their own. Women tend to do things in ceremony together, you know, and and I think it's, you know, we, we really feel connection and we really speak that out. We're relational. And, and so really bringing that back to the fore that, you know, there are times when you want to be on your own and work on your own, but coming together, you know, and I say in circle, but it might be, you know, sitting around mm -hmm. at the coffee table at a cafe, you know, but somewhere where you could actually give each other time and space to listen. And I think the togetherness and the coming together is essential. If we're going to heal the earth, we actually need to understand that what happens to you happens to me in, in one sense. And we've cut ourselves off from that knowing and wisdom, but um, we're in this together. We really are. And so that's another important reason to connect with Sarah, because even if you go with an intention to make a drum or learn more about menopause, you get at this benefit of being in circle and connection with women. And there's magic in that, what that will be will be dependent on you know what comes on the day really but and who's there but that's um that's definitely part of the wisdom and and offering that you provide so thank you so much for being here today sarah thank you Penny. It's been a pleasure.